calendar. Major fist bump. <coughs> the uh, Senior Citizens Fish Prize the 21st of May. I know that, I know we're still in March, but May will be here quick. It'll be, uh, it's, what, April is when? Friday. Friday. <laughs> April Fool's Day. Yep. <laughs> and then our revival will be June the 12th through the 16th. Amen. With Brother Caleb Silvertooth, and so you can pray for that. Marshall County Post Vacation Bible School. And uh, it's again uh, <coughs> July the 31st. Brother Michael, is that Christy's brother? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're not happy about it? <coughs> oh, I'm happy. <coughs> I love Brother Caleb. He's just, he is the. He, you would not know that they are kin. Really? He's six foot five. Or six foot four. Yeah. And he wears a beard. Good yeah. beard. Better beard than me. Uh, but uh, he's real. Hmm? Uh, but he, he's real slender. He's not as slender as he once was. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's been married for a few years. That's, that's helped him out some. I guess. But, uh, but he, is, he is very fiery. <coughs> Good. Very, very fine. So I, I think you'll enjoy him. He's a good, really good preacher. Hey, He's been pastoring the church there in Patterson for. Is he the oldest one? No, no, sir. He's younger. Well, of course, they're all younger than Christy, but he's the youngest boy. So it's Christy, is the eldest, Clint, Caleb, Amber, and Leah. So y'all met Leah. You've met all the girls, you haven't met the boys. Oh, no. So uh, you'll get to meet one of the boys. Awesome. He's married to Josh yeah. um, Adams. Ha Big Adams. Josh, Josh Adams. We we just say Big Josh, Little Josh. That's what we always. Yeah. So Big Josh's sister. So the the family's intermarried twice. Yeah. <laughs> Josh married Amber. Yeah. Caleb married uh, Rachel. Rachel, which is Josh's. Y'all keep it tight. Um, yeah. Two Double cousins, and they have five kids. Anyway. But yes, that's him. Okay. Who do we need to pray for? Who do we want to mention tonight for prayer? We bring up my mom. They had taken the emergency room yesterday. Uh, but uh, she, she used to go home. She was just dehydrated and had a UTI. And so she, anyway, there was some issues there. So we pray for her. She's a plan. But, uh, who else do we want to mention? He lost a great grandson yesterday, and also Mike Smith, who got killed in a wreck yesterday in Shreveport. He was 20 years old. Oh, my goodness. He's a member of these families. And the Permitter family. The Permitter family. And the Harris, <coughs> Harris family. The Harris family. I'd like to remember the Allen family, Dana Allen. Okay. Uh, she used to be our director, and she passed away. All right. She uh, that was a that was a hit, but she she had moved on. She wasn't okay. up there anymore. She had been gone about five years. Okay. But she was our director and super super sweet lady, and uh, got cancer and just took her out. All right. Let's pray for the Allen family as well tonight. Moody family. Josh Moody. Moody family. Okay. Lots of lots of loss. Here lately. Let's... Who else tonight? Brother Johnny Howard's family. His wife passed away with the day there. Right. Passed away. Now I don't know none of the details. All I know is he passed away. Howard? Okay. Howard family. Okay. All right. Call attention to Matt Jordan on the prayer list. Matt, Matt is doing well, so maybe we can remove him. All right. Thank y'all for praying for Matt. All right. Amen. Just add Don Ritchie to our prayer list. Yes, um, brother Don Ritchie, uh, his cancer has come back and so I didn't lift him up 
ma'am. He, yes, he's having hip, hip, a lot of hip pain as well. So uh, just pray for him. Jim Wheatley's not doing well. Okay, let's do lift up Brother Jim. Lord, Miss Zonia. And uh, no, we also, Miss Tina Cleans is. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. I'm on. My mic's on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can actually use your voice. I use. I'm trying to use my voice. My inside voice. All right. Sorry about that. I guess nobody else wanted to hear me because they, they weren't saying anything. So, any anyone else? Unspoken. unspoken. Anybody else unspoken need? All over the place. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll we'll look to the go to the Word of God this <clears throat> this evening. And uh, brother Buddy, would you would you lead us and pray for these needs tonight, please? Amen tonight. Well, um, we hadn't, still haven't settled on a study to take up, and so anybody got suggestion? I want you to go to Genesis. I want you to go to Genesis tonight. It's not where we're going to be. Um. All of the Bible is good, so there's no bad place to go. It's just finding the thing that the Lord, I think the Lord would have us to do. And um, But tonight, I, I want to I point out something to you 
that I, as I read this um, a familiar passage of Scripture, and we've read it many times, but I think there's some lessons that, that we need to learn here and uh, on how God deals with His children and how God deals with us. And I'm not talking about just in a... Um, I love positive... I love positive preaching. I'm not quite Joel Osteen, but I like positive preaching, okay? I, I like to, we like to emphasize the positive <laughs> over the negative, all right? But there are negative aspects of, of, uh, of, our, of life and, uh, and even as God deals with us. And, this, and this, there are some lessons here that, that I think we, we should learn. And I shouldn't have. Uh, but anyway, all right. Genesis 29. So this is the story that we're picking up Jacob's life. We know Jacob had a brother. Jacob and his brother was born, whose name was? Esau. Esau. Jacob and Esau was born to? Isaac and Rebekah had two sons. Uh, they were twins, correct? Matter of fact, Jacob stuck his hand out first, right? And didn't she put a, a band on his arm, the nursemaid? Anyway, doesn't matter. I, I get my Bible stories all mixed up. Anyway, they named, named him Jacob, which means supplanter. He was the second born. We know how that Esau was a daddy's boy, bred, hairy. Um, Jacob was a plain man. The Bible says he lived in tents. He was a mama's boy. Je Isaac got old, was getting old, and he. The well, first thing that Jacob did was he stole the birthright from Esau, or got Esau to sell him the birthright over a bowl of red beans and rice. And that's not in the Bible, but you just have to read the Greek to get that. And he for just for a bowl of beans, basically. He sold, uh, he sold his birthright, which, is the, which was the honor uh, the, to be first place in the family and to get the double portion that was belonged to the firstborn. And then he steals the blessing. We, we know how he, he, he gets the goat, kills it, uh, puts the hair on his arms and puts Jacob's garment on. Esau said he's going to kill him, so Jacob leaves and he's on his way uh, to uh, Haran. It's, his mom and dad have sent him there. He on his way, verse in chapter 28, on his way, he spends the night in Bethel, which means the house of God. He stays the night there and as he dreams, he sees a ladder that reaches heaven and there are angels descending up and down that ladder. And God speaks to Jacob personally in that dream and says that I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. And so Jacob, that's where Jacob is. And so in verse 1 of chapter number 29, and uh, the Bible says this, Then Jacob went on his journey, came into the land of the people of the east, and he looked and beheld a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it, uh, for out of that well they watered the flock, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran, of Haran, uh, we are, and he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We be well. And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day. Neither is it time for that cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. That we water, then we water the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it was come to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, that the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, 
uh, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the whale's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was his father's, her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said unto him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him a space of a month. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me what shall be thy be thy way, what shall thy wages be? Excuse me. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee. Then that I should give her unto another man, abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto her daughter Leah Zilpah, his maid, for a handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is it that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore, then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week. And we will give thee this also for the service that thou shalt serve me yet seven year, other years. And Jacob did so, fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel his daughter to wife also. And Laban gave Rachel his daughter Bilhah his handmaiden to be her maid. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord hath given, hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And I'm going to stop off reading there, but she conceives again and has Simeon. She conceives again and has Levi. And she conceives again and bears Judah. So she has four, four boys right off the bat. Lord, we love you, and we ask that you help us as we look at your word and the lessons that we have, that you have for us in your word. We thank you again for those that are here. I pray you bless them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here we have Jacob who, uh, let me back up and say this. We, we've heard the statements that, that uh, you know, the, the chickens come home to roost, right? We've heard that statement. When your chickens come home to roost or... Uh, uh, they used to say crime doesn't pay unless you're a politician. But I mean, the crime doesn't pay, you know, it, we, 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 our warning. Everything that goes around comes around. Those are kind of statements. And that's really a Bible truth. There's really a Bible truth there, right? Huh? Because you read what we sow. But we, 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 people like to quote eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth comes out of the Old Testament, of course. But there are... Again, the principles there, Numbers 23, or 30, excuse me, 32, 23 says, Be sure, be sure your sin will find you out. He also says, we know in Galatians 6, 7, uh, Be not deceived. Don't, in other words, don't deceive yourself. God's not mocked. You're not going to make a mockery of God. For whatsoever man soweth, he'll going to reap. And that's the biblical truth. That's true in our lives. That's true in our lives. And again, God's gracious, God's loving, God's kind. But God's also a good father. He's also a good father. Now Jacob leaves this place of Bethel with a spring in his step. He is excited because God has spoken to him and God has promised him. And said, listen, uh, you're going to go and you're going to come back to this land. We're going to give you this land. And all of those things, promises that God makes to him, makes to him while he's there in Bethel that night. But he is still going to make a pit stop. Now his idea was he's going to go to Haran. He's going to find him a wife. He's going to spend a little time there. And then he's going to come back. 
to Beersheba. But that's not what's going to happen. He's going to spend 20 years in Haran. And there's, there's the question is, why did God send him there? Why did God send Jacob to Haran? Because we understand, and I believe, and I think y'all know what I believe by now, that God doesn't do anything on accident, and everything is done on purpose. There's no ha happenstance with God. And so, real quickly, why did he go on to find a wife? Right? He was sent so that he might find a wife. And it's an amazing story. It's, it's a, a true love story. I mean, the Bible says that he, he, he gets there and... As he's standing by the well, here comes Rachel, which is, would be his first cousin. And it's love, it's, they become kissing cousins. Love at first sight. You could almost say they were from Arkansas. All right? But they, she comes, and, and the Bible says that he, he falls in love with her, and he says, I'll work for you. For seven years, just so I can marry her. I know it. And he does. And the Bible says one of the greatest, I think one of the greatest little love quotes in all the Bible. It says that, he seen, that the, they seemed unto him, in verse 20 it says, they seemed to him but a few days for the love that he had for her. I mean, he was in love. And that seven years flew by, and he didn't think nothing of it. Because of how much he loved Rachel. And boy, that's an amazing thing. And God's sitting there to find a wife. He's sitting there to meet his uncle. Hey, okay? Laban. Now, Laban is a character that, as I was thinking about him, I was thinking about the fact that uh, Jacob was a deceiver. But he was little league compared to his uncle. He really was. He, he deceived his brother, but what's about to happen to him, what Laban's going to do to him, makes what he did over here seem, seem small. He's about to really step up his game. Not only did he meet his uncle and find a wife, but he also found another wife. Which is that, you read the Bible and think about what you're reading sometimes. And I, this, will get, this will be off track. But I, this morning, I was reading 1 Samuel about how the Philistines took the ark of God. Hop, nine, Phineas died. I know, Micah. But it's just, it's just, it's just the, the meant, I didn't share this with Micah. But you go, go read that story if you haven't. And, and the Philistines take the ark of God. They think they've done something. They put, it in the, they put it in the temple of Dagon. Dagon falls over on his face. They set Dagon back up. He falls back over this time. His hands fall off and his head falls off. So they move the ark. They say, we've got to get him out of the temple of our God because our God keeps falling down before him. And then God smites, <coughs> smites the Philistines. And you know what he smites them with? The, what God, the, the judgment of God falls on the Philistines because they have the ark of God. And you know what God does to them? Go read that story. With hemorrhoids. He strikes them with hemorrhoids. The Bible calls them hemorrhoids, but it's hemorrhoids. And he's destroying, I mean, it, and it's not just a mild case, evidently. They're dying. I mean, you ever read the Bible and just, and go, wow. The, some of the stories that take place in the Bible. Now, that didn't have anything to do with this one. But it's just, sometimes we read the Bible because we're trying to read our daily Bible schedule. And we don't take time to think about what's going on in the story. That story this morning, I read this, I said, that's an amazing, that's, I mean, that, it's gross. And it's, you know, but it's just, wow. The judge, God says, I'm gonna, they're, they've taken the ark, I'm going to judge them. This is how I'm going to judge them. Hey, Okay. Y'all are saying, hurry up, Michael. But this story is also one of those stories that I, I read it and I go, wow. Because here it is. He was served seven years. He says, I want my wife. Laban says, all right, let's have a big banquet. And they have a big deal. Everybody's there. And what takes place in those, in those Eastern weddings and in that time and still to date in some places 
they have the big wedding ceremony, big feast. The husband retires to the, the wedding chamber, the bed chamber, and the dad of the bride brings the bride to the husband, to the door, and, and ushers her in, and they consummate the relationship. And Jacob, and you say, there's so many questions that pop in your head about this deal. Where was Rachel? What was she doing? When, what, you know, in all this deal. Uh, why would Leah agree to this? And all those things that I ask this question. I just also understand that that culture is different than our culture. Okay? And they do things differently. But nonetheless, as I read this story, the Bible says, uh, and, and so... Uh, I'm trying to find the verse because it's... I, I've got a point to make, by the way. Oh, verse 25. So Leah comes in. They consummate the relationship. Jacob wakes up in the morning and rolls over. And the Bible says, behold. And, and the way it's written, it's like... Surprise, surprise. surprise. I can see it in your eyes. I mean, that... You know, Ernest T. Bass type stuff, you know. It's, I mean, it, he's shocked, which he should be shocked. And the Bible, I mean, he rolls, it's, it's a shock to his system. So much that he goes to his dad-in-law and says, What have you done to me? You've deceived me. Which is the same thing that his daddy said about him. When he tricked him to get Esau's blessings, he says, your brother's deceived me. It's the same thing. And you see how God deals with his children sometimes. How sometimes he'll take us to, to Haran. And he does that. So we find, I f don't know why I find that so comical, but I find that quite comical that he wakes up the way that he does and sees that it's not the one that he thought it was. Anyway. To my point. Y'all ready? He marries. He start, by the way. Seven, they fulfill the seven days of the marriage ceremony. And he marries Rachel right after that. So he, this boy goes from being single. To being married twice in a week. Having two wives. In a week's time. And the Bible says that he loves Rachel. Despises Leah. That Leah is tender-eyed. She's, uh, I don't know what that, she, she has a, her beautiful eyes. But Rachel is a beautiful, I guess, everywhere. She's just a beautiful person. Attractive. Now, I said all that to say this. Ready? As I was thinking about it. You find these things happening in his life. He deceived his brother and his dad. Now he is being deceived by his father-in-law. He ignored the principle of the firstborn right. Now he's been forced because that's what Laban said about Leah. Well, it's not lawful for us to give the younger before the elder. So that's why I did this. So now he is being forced to observe that law that he had ignored before. Esau was forced to live with the results of Jacob's deception. Now Jacob's having to live with the results of Laban's deception. So why, the question again is, why would God send him to Haran? And I believe this. I believe there are times in our life, spiritually speaking, where we take, uh, as, as I read somewhere, on the bus line to heaven, the promised land. However you want to say it. There are stops sometimes in Haran. It stops for us. Why would God cause us to stop there? And there, there's a few things. One, so that you'd, we'd have time to think about what we've done. Sometimes God puts us in a place so we can think about what we've done. And I believe this was a place for Jacob. Jacob would have some time. He thought it was just, he thought he was getting away from Esau. Esau wants to kill me. Let me get away from him a little. Let me cool down. And then I'll go right back home. But God said, no, what you need is a timeout. Anybody ever give their kids timeouts? My dad and mom never gave us timeout. But timeout. A, a time to think. And sometimes God puts us in a place where he wants us to think about what it is We've done. 
But we're too distracted as a society. I'm, I'm the world's worst. I, the invention of the air, the, what's those things called? Ear pods, air pods, whatever those. Huh? AirPods. AirPods, whatever they are. I mean, because now I can listen to preaching or listen to music all the time. I mean, I can sit my phone down, walk around with my, my, one of my ears plugged up all the time, listen to something. And it's, there's nothing wrong with listening to things and listening to good stuff if it's good stuff. But at the same time, it keeps you from having to think. Come on now. That's, that's why we turn the television on. I'm going to be honest. I'm, y'all, most of the time, I turn the TV on so I don't have to think. Because I can just watch the TV and sit there like, like a dummy, not on a log. Yeah. Because when it gets quiet and there's no racket and there's no noise, then immediately I have to think. My mind begins to go places. And I think God puts us in Haran sometimes. To cause us to think about how we've done. Or what we've done. How we're living. The direction of our lives. And so we must be prepared for times. When God calls time out on us. When God puts us in those places. Sometimes God puts us flat on our back. I remember my preacher growing up. Not growing up. The preacher I served at in Kilgore. My, the first time I was on staff. And he he would say, uh, he had a really back, some back problems and, and end up where he just had to, lay, it was like two or three weeks, he was just on his back. And he was talking about the, how his relationship with the Lord grew. At first, he was mad and angry. But then as, as a few days passed and all he could do was sit there, lay there and read and lay there and, and, and think, the relationship with the Lord grew. And sometimes, guess what God does to us, church? Sometimes God puts us in a place where we have to think about where we are and how we're living. Number two, let me say this. I think sometimes God puts us in Haran. So the same reason he puts Jacob in there. And that is to, to point, to humble us in what we thought we could do. Because this is what I, this is, again, some of this is my conjecture. But here's the deal. Jacob was a supplanter. He was the trickster. He was the conniver. You're talking about a guy who's always, you know, says someone said he was playing chess and everybody else was playing checkers. He was seeing how he could get out ahead of everybody else. I, hey, listen, I, being the second born, I'll just, I, I'll, my brother, get him to make a bad choice and sell me his birthright. Let me steal his blessing. Uh, let, me, let me take advantage of people whenever and wherever I can. And so now he's at a place, and guess what's happened to him? He's at a place where what he th- his ability to manipulate people, guess what has happened? I mean, his dad-in-law saw a sucker. Just like my dad. I mean, <clears throat> no. His dad-in-law, I mean, that's just my mind. And I don't know, I know I wasn't part of that culture. And some of that is cultural. But the fact of the matter is, he said, you know, I got 14. And first thing that's comical about it, he says, I'll serve you for Rachel. And he goes, well, I might as well give it to her than some other fella. It wasn't a ringing endorsement, okay? That wasn't, I, that wasn't one of those deals where I, I, I can't wait to give you my daughter. It's, well, it's the best we can do right now. It's basically what he said. And then he, soon as he deceives him the first time, he, he says, you know what? I got a deal for you. You worked seven more years. So 14 years he works for those wives. Really, he works for one wife. He really only wanted the one. Ma'am? And he, yes, he ends up with four. He's, uh, but it's, but I, but I see it as God humbling him in an area of his life where he thought he was strong. And that is manipulating people. Controlling the situation. Working out. And, I, and I, when I say conniving, I'm, and just, just, just figuring everything out. Have you ever got to a place where you did not know what to do? Yeah. Yeah. 
Have you ever, you ever got found, I heard a preacher preach on this years ago, and, and uh, if I could remember the points, I'd preach it and say it was my own. But he preached on about how our strengths become our weaknesses. And he talked about all throughout the Bible, if you look at a lot of Bible characters, what you find is the thing that they were strong in caused them to be weak. They, they failed in that area. And we do that because the Bible says the man that thinks he stands needs to take where, be, beware, because that's the one who's most prone to fall. And that's a paraphrase. But listen, we have to be careful about thinking that we are all right. Peter, prime example, big mouth Peter. I don't care if everybody leaves you. Everybody can leave you. I'll never leave you and I'll never deny you. I'll die with you. That's what he said. Now when he said it, I'm sure he meant it. But that didn't happen that way, did it? For the cock, for the rooster crowed three times, or <clears throat> excuse me, for, he, for the rooster crowed, he denied him three times. And so I think sometimes God puts us in Haran to make us think, give us time to think about the direction of our life and what we're doing. But he also puts us in Haran sometimes so that he can show us that, that where our strength lies is not in our own abilities, but our strength lies in him. And sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Yeah. We have to. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes, and I know you think this is funny, but this is true. And me and Josh was talking about the other night. Sometimes I get a sermon together that I think is, it's good. this is going to be good. This is going to be a good one. And sometimes I get up and I preach the ones that I, and a lot of times this happens, the ones that we think are going to be A pluses. And y'all are all saying, I've never heard you preach an A-plus sermon. That's all right. But the ones I think are A-plus ends up falling and failing. And the ones that I'm, I don't think are going to be very good, or I don't think are going to accomplish, are the ones that I think I missed on, seem to be the ones that are more effective. And it's, I believe, and we talked about that the other night. I said, I think it's God's way of keeping the preacher humble. <laughs> it really is. Keep him humble. Because otherwise, he... You think, well, aren't I something? All right. Y'all y'all ready for me to move on? It's so we can think. It's so we can be humble. It's also so that we can build character. Jacob is going to have to learn. Um, there's a big push in... In our country, there's a big thing about equity in our country. Everybody being equal. And can I say this without, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but we're not equal. Now, our Constitution and the government that was set up said that we are, he, they said we're created equal. And then he goes on, they go on to say this. We're endowed with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, even our founders had enough sense to realize that even though you and I are all created by God, there is not, e and we're equal in the sense of we have those rights, that there is no equality of outcome. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Okay? If that was the case, then I should be in the NBA. I love basketball. I do. And I used to tell my brother who's, y'all have seen my brother. I said, if I was your size, I would have been in the NBA. Because I played ball all the time. But that's not how it works. Just because we are created equal and we have the right to pursue happiness. I'm talking about just in our constitution. But we have this push that everybody's got to be equal. We've got to be paid equally. And we've got to be... And I'm not trying to be political about it. But it, it's never going to happen. And it's never going to work. And life sometimes is not fair. It just isn't. Why do some people that we know and love go through trouble and go through sickness and go through pain and lose people? And then and, and you and I, we, we don't maybe. And you say, well, that's just not fair. And life isn't. And God never promised that it's going to be fair all the time. 
He's always right and he's always just and he always does what's good. But from our perspective, sometimes life isn't fair. And sometimes when we go through life and things don't, aren't fair, it builds character. It's either going to build character or it's going to build resentment. And I tell, I, matter of fact, I told one of my kids the other day, it's not going to happen, it's, something's not going to work the way you want it to work. So just suck it up, buttercup. And go on. And let it, be, let it teach you and let it help you and you be a better person because of it instead of getting mad and saying, life's not fair, this is not fair. And I believe in the life of, of Jacob, he had to learn and build some character. And God does that to us. Because character's not born, it's built. And I don't care if we're 100 years old or we're 20 years old, you, we're always in the need of building. Okay. One more thing, I'll let you go. Y'all are done. I can tell. God puts us in Haranta to humble us and to teach us, to grow us, to give us time to think. But he also does that sometimes to prepare us for what he's doing in the future. Because Jacob comes to Haran poor, penniless. He didn't have anything. He's running for his life. Now, he might have had a little bit, but he didn't have much. He leaves Haran with flocks and herds and, like Miss Paula said, four wives. And a bunch of kids. Well, I think 11, if I'm not mistaken, when he leaves Haran. I don't know if Benjamin had been born yet, but I think everybody else had been. He, he leaves with all of that. that. What will be the nation of Israel? Because down the road, he's going to wrestle with God. And God's going to change his name. He's going to say, you're no longer a deceiver and a supplanter, but your name is going to be Israel because you are a prince. And his name's going to change, and those boys will make up the tribes of Israel, and that whole nation comes out of Haran. The place where God had to put him to discipline him, to teach him. Now here's the thought that I'll give you and I'll close. We have, I have been to Haran. Not physically, but I have been spiritually. Hebrews chapter 12, look at one verse. I was going to not do it, but look at one verse. Chapter 12 Verse 11. He says this. Now no chastening. No discipline. If you will. For the present seemeth to be joyous. But grievous. There was never a day. When dad took black beauty off the wall. And brought it to my, the room. Black beauty was the belt that. I've told that story. We had a belt that hung on the wall in our house. It was shiny. It was about that wide. It was only used to discipline us with. So it hung on the wall. And any time you were going to get disciplined, you had to go get Black Beauty and take it to the bedroom and sit and wait for him to come. It did not gather dust in our house. Well worn. He had, he, and this is besides the point, this don't cost nothing. Extra, but he had read somewhere about not, or he had heard a preacher preach on not using your personal belt, but because children associate that with you to use an object that is not personal to you to discipline with. So that's where Black Beauty came in. Black Beauty was was hung on the wall, and uh, and that's all it was used for. That's the only thing it was used for. And you'd have to go get it, go sit in the room. And I've always wondered why we sat so long. I think it was because he was cooling down. So he didn't kill us when he got in there. But anyway, such a point. I never thought, I never ever one time looked at Black Beauty and said, boy, that's great. That was an instrument of destruction. It was grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. My daddy 
did not whoop me as, and I know, you know, this, that's hard to say nowadays. Nobody wants to physically spank their children anymore. But my dad never did it in anger. He was always, but he was always right when he did it. And he did not give me as many as I deserved. I got away with some things. But I have a heavenly father who is my father. And I am his child, and he loves me. He loves me unconditionally. He is gracious to me. He pours out his mercy on me. He, the, the psalmist said his benefits are new. Uh, or his mercies are new every morning. He daily loadeth us with benefits. That's all because I'm part of the family of God. And that's how it was to be in the MacArthur house. Had all the benefits of the MacArthur house. I had a place to stay, and there was food on my table. I didn't have to work for none of that stuff. I, I was taken. I was bought. I was given things, gifts, just because I was his child. I can't tell you how many John Deere tractors I played with in the dirt because Dad loved his kids. But then there were days, and there were times, when he would go get Black Beauty, or he would have me go get it. And there are times when our Heavenly Father will take us to Haran. Because we need time out. Yes, and we need to be humbled. And we need to grow. And we need to realize, again, that there are some things in our life that need to change. And when we're there, we need to thank Him for it. Amen. That's the difficult part. Because we've all been there. But have we thanked Him for it? When I was a kid, and again, I'm done. When I was a kid, my dad would do something to me that, that was near child abuse. Not really. Everybody's looking. He would take, he would we'd get the belt, we'd go to the room, we'd wait for him to come, he'd come, he'd do his business, and then he would say, go dry it up, go clean your face, and go to your room. And I'd go to my room. And I had, we had bunk beds. I, I slept on the top bunk. Jason was on the bottom. But I'd sit up on my bed. And in a few minutes. In would come my dad. And my dad would come to me. And he would say. I love you. I love you. And he says. You're still my buddy. Aren't you? That's what he did every time. And I learned, and it took me a while, that that man, every time he did that, he was not perfect. He's not perfect. But every time he did it, he did it because he wanted me to be better. And he wanted better of me. He wasn't doing it because he liked to do it. He didn't do it because it was a joy to him. He did it because he wanted me to be more than I was. And today, I thank God for every time he took me and I had to go to the bedroom. Every time. I thank God for it. And again, knowing that there were a lot of times that he missed. And when I think about what God does in my life, sometimes when I'm in, uh, in those Haran places. I don't want to thank him. But we need to. Because he says this. One more point. He says, if he doesn't take you to Haran. If he doesn't discipline you. And if he doesn't chasten you. Then you're not his. Then you're illegitimate. You're pretending to be something that you're not. But his children, he will discipline. His children, he takes to Iran. And we need to thank God for those times, as hard as it is sometimes, to thank him for. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. I pray you bless your people. And Lord, thank you again. Keep us safe as we go about the rest of the week. And bring us back again next time. We'll ask it in Christ's name. Amen.